evening, church. Good evening. Have you ever thought we find it often in the Bible? And if we think about it, and we started to look at these scriptures, you would find many times when we come across this word servant or variations of the word servant. In fact, when we look to servant, the definition of it is a person employed by another, if you were to look at it today. But the first time we see it is in the book of Genesis, when we read the Bible. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 25, and there is a curse laid upon Canaan because of Ham and the wickedness he had done in, in the, in the uh, view of his father's nakedness, when we read there of Noah. Now, in here in Genesis, it means a servant, bonded, a bondman, uh, a bond servant. And we think that word bond servant. Interestingly, Paul uses that same word to describe himself in his service to Christ. We look at the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1 and verse 1. He identifies himself as a bondservant of Christ. Again in Galatians 1 and verse 10. And again in Titus 1 and verse 1. But Paul's not the only one. Because when we look to James, in James chapter 1 and verse 1, he also identifies himself as a bondservant, as does Peter. In 2 Peter 1, in verse 1, and also Jude, in Jude 1, in verse 1. And so we see this term of bondservant, or servant. I want you to look with me at Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, Paul writes this, if you have a subheading to this chapter, mine says, be like Christ. And it says here, beginning in verse 5, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to the cross. Christ is the supreme example to us of unselfishness. He, he, we look to him in his humility, his willingness to serve, to be a servant. He stands out above anyone else in the Bible. We think of Paul here, and he calls us to have the same mind as Christ. And in fact, in writing the Corinthians, he talks about to imitate him as he also imitated Christ. And we can look to Paul's life. We talked about that in the Sunday morning Bible study. We're looking at the life of Paul. And the attitude Paul had from going from a Pharisee and persecuting the church to being this person who was persecuted for promoting the church. Paul understood and seriously took this notion of a servant upon himself, understanding and realizing who Christ really was. We look to Christ, though, when we view him, and we see similarities to that what one would think of, of being a servant, lowly, humble, meek, obedient, persecuted, wrongly treated. He took on all those attributes in the form of man to be an example to us of what a true servant really is. Look with me to Isaiah chapter 53. Now, Isaiah chapter 53, again, if you have one of those little subheadings above your chapters, mine says here, the suffering servant. And this is a description or, or a prophecy of the Messiah. Notice what he says, though, in Isaiah 53, in verse 9. His grave was assigned to the wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Now, the verses just before this are exactly what the Ethiopian was reading when we read Acts chapter 8, and Philip comes upon him. His question to Philip, when he asked, do you understand what you're reading? He says, one, how can I let someone guide me? But then he poses the question, who is the prophet speaking of? Of himself or someone else? And we're told that Philip preaches Jesus to him from these verses of Isaiah. Now, when we look at here, Jesus was met with contempt. He was condemned to the death of a servant. He was a signed to that grave of a, of a servant or a criminal. And yet, we know of Joseph of Arimathea who comes and he asks for the body and lays him in a tomb. And so he didn't stay in that place. He didn't go to the place which had been the typical grave for those crucified. And so, again, going back 
who does the prophet say it is? Himself or some other man? And Philip preached Jesus to him. And though king of kings and lord of lords, he displayed the attributes of a servant, even the suffering of a servant. When we think of Jesus, he came to this earth, that he was God in the flesh, that he had all the attributes of God. You know, we, we sing the song, he could have called 10,000 angels. And yet, he didn't do that. He took on all those roles of a servant to demonstrate to us Luke chapter 2. Now, in Luke chapter 2, it describes an incident with Jesus in the temple when he was just at the age of 12. And we find him here. Uh, his parents have found him missing. They, they look for him in the caravan. They can't find him. They end up going back to Jerusalem. And they with the teachers. Notice what we read in Luke 2 and verse 49. And he said to them, Why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be about my father's house? Now these are the first recorded words we have of Jesus speaking. His last recorded words are going to the world to make disciples. But here is his first words. And he says, one, he, that he is the son of God. He has to be about his father's business. He wasn't talking about Joseph. But he also marvels that they should be surprised where to find him. It, it, you know, why would you wonder where I'm at? I have to be about my father's house or my father's business, your translation may say. And really, when we look to this, the original language shows that it was necessary, that it behooved him, that it was a must or an ought or a should. Where else would I be but about my father's house or my father's business? Well, what it was he must was in relation to the father and to what as a servant or a son was expected of him. Even in the earthly realm, when we think of you know, a father and son, where is a son? Is he not within his father's house? Is he not about his father's business? We think of you know, traditionally the way things were in the past, not so much today. But, you know, in the Jewish culture especially, you know, if you were a tent maker, your son was going to be a tent maker. If you were a, a butcher, your son would be a butcher. They trained and they took over in that role, a carpenter, and your son would be a carpenter. And so Jesus was about all those things, even to his earthly father, but especially to his heavenly father. And we notice that this marks his mind, that he was always about the things of God. And we would expect, again, a child to be about their father's business. And, and notice what we learn of him. It says in verse 49, But they did not understand the statement which he made to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth, and he continued, notice what it says, in subjection to them. And his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with men. You know, when we go back to the Old Testament, in Exodus 20, and verse 12, it says to honor your father and your mother. And this is just what Jesus did. He did it, one, as a servant of God. He was obeying God's command. He did it, two, because he was honoring his mother and his father. Notice after that time in Jerusalem, it says he went back and he was in subjection to them. He, he gave his, his will over to the father's will, which commanded him to be obedient to his parents. He modeled again to us what it was to be in subjection, what it was to be a servant, and it wasn't a bad thing. What about us? Those of us who have accepted Christ, we have been baptized into the body of Christ, we have become heirs with Christ and children of God. Are we in subjection to our Heavenly Father? Do we do the things that He says? Are we about His business? Something to consider. Look with me to Matthew chapter 10. In Matthew chapter 10, during Jesus' ministry, he referred to himself as a servant many times. And his servant, in Mark 10, in verse 45, he says that he, he did not come to be served, but to serve. In John 6, in verse 38, he says he didn't come to do his will, but the, one, uh, the will of the one who sent him. In Luke 22, in verse 27, that he was here to serve. And he gave the strongest example of this in John 13 when he washed the disciples' feet. But notice what he says here when we read Matthew 10, beginning in verse 24. And again, I have a subheading, the meaning of disciples. 
And then, you know, these are things that are added. They're not part of the inspired word, but they help us to understand what the chapter is about. It says, a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. It, it is enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher, and the slave like it were meant to prepare the disciples for the persecution that Jesus was treated with contempt. It was for his teachings and his character. It was his whole manner of being. That humble, lowly servant. And the disciples who exhibited the same then could expect the same. They weren't above the master. If they persecuted him, they'll persecute those who follow him. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4. Who could expect to be suffered? Well, Peter says in chapter 4 and verse 16, but if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in, his, in this name. Peter had laid out in the chapters leading up to this that those who were Christians that were suffering were blessed for their suffering. I'm reminded of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount and talking about those suffering and being blessed. But they were blessed for the cause of their suffering, not the suffering itself. They're being servants to Christ. That is why they were suffering. They were exhibiting those attributes that, that Jesus had demonstrated. Suffering, there is no shame. There's no shame in that. And in fact, God is glorified when we exhibit those characteristics of Jesus. And if we suffer for them, it brings more glory to God. This is the reason Peter and the others that were with him, they could rejoice at their punishment of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish court. When we read chapters like Acts 5 and verse 41, we find it strange that they could be threatened and beaten, but yet go away glorifying and rejoicing. And the reason being was the reason for their suffering, that they were accounted to suffer as Christ suffered, meaning that they were exhibiting the attributes and the characteristics that Jesus had demonstrated to us of being a servant. Now, we should never be ashamed when we're following Christ, and if we suffer for Christ. Look with me to John chapter 12. 12, beginning in verse 25. This is the context of Jesus going to uh, uh, Lazarus, when, well, actually to Martha and Mary when Lazarus had died. And of course, we know that he raises Lazarus. But there's a conversation between him and Martha where there is a question over the resurrection. And she has no doubt about the resurrection. She, I know that Lazarus was raised in the last day. And of course, we know that he's about to raise Lazarus then and there. And he says in verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? This is the Lord's answer to all who would be his disciples. We must accept his teachings and his manner of life. Just as a servant is bound to the wishes and desires of his master, we as Christians are bound to the wishes and desires of Christ. Those who are truly Christ will be in total submission to his will, giving up their own will. And this is a total commitment for life. That this is not a one-time passing thing. That we as children will, will honor the Father and we will receive the blessings of the Father when we are humble and submit to him. Well, 1 John 2, verse 25 says, and this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. You know, it's not something we earn. It's not like a, a give and take, trade off. The reason that we are servants and humble and submit to his will is because he has promised us eternal life. Grace. And yet it's not without some requirements in order to obtain it. But in fulfilling those things that the Lord has determined, we're not earning our salvation. We're simply doing him for what he has done, what he is going to do. Lastly, look with me to John 15. John 15, beginning in verse 14. He says, you are my servants if you do what I command you. This is Jesus speaking. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I choose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit, 
and that your fruit would remain, so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give you. This I command you, that you love one another. If it surprised you to think of Jesus as a servant at the beginning of our lesson, will it surprise you that he calls us to be more than servants, to be better servants? Look at this. We're still bond servants. But Paul, Peter, Jude, that's what they all said. They were bond servants. But note the difference. Where one word meant a slave or a servant, the word they chose to use had the meaning of being a slave either voluntarily or involuntarily. Those who have put on Christ in baptism have become slaves to Christ voluntarily. We have chosen that. And you know, it's interesting that in Exodus 21, there was a law in the Old Testament. If a slave was freed and they loved their master and they didn't want to leave their master, there were provisions made that they could seal themselves to their master. And they would stay with that master for the rest of their lives. They were still a servant. But they were more than a servant. They were a willing servant. Because of the love of their master and the love they had for their master. When we put on Christ in baptism, we have simply sealed ourselves to Christ because of his love for us and our love for him. And so we are no longer the servants that we would think of as that slave, but we are servants who willingly, serving in the house of the Lord, not in the fields, although we do serve in the fields in, the, in our evangelism efforts. But no longer are we free to live and act in any manner that we want. We're bound by the master, by the servant, to his desires. And like Jesus, we must be about the Father's business. And that's what it is to be a servant. We are to be obedient, to honor God, bring glory to him. Jesus died for our sins. But he was raised and he ascended to heaven. And he offers us the same opportunity to one day be raised and to reach heaven. Look at John 15, verses 12 and 13. He says, This is my commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. In our service as a servant, we're to lay down our lives for Jesus. He calls us to deny ourselves, take up our cross daily, to even deny mother or father, mother or sister for him. And we look at this and he calls us to serve one another. We're to die to self, love God, and love one another. These are the qualities that he speaks of as being a servant. Not the servant we may think of, but the true example of a servant. Putting the needs of one another before ourselves putting the needs of God before ourselves. That's the true meaning of service. This master is the risk. A master that is benevolent. A master that is gracious. A master that is merciful. And a master that is rewarding. Do we believe that? If we believe that, we're going to live our lives in accordance with that. This evening, we offer an invitation. If you haven't been living your life in accordance with with the will of the Father, why don't you make changes? We read in 1 John 1 that if we would repent and confess of him, he's faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. That the blood of Christ constantly cleanses us. But what if you haven't had that blood of Christ applied to you for that constant cleansing? Well, he also tells us we have heard and we believe that Jesus is the Christ. If we're willing to repent, to turn away from our ways of doing things into God's way of doing things, to change mind, we action, that he will accept us. He calls us to confess him before others that we believe Jesus is the Christ. And then to humble ourselves to his will, being baptized, buried in water. And that's where he tells us that he will wash away our sins, add us to his church, and enroll our names in the book of life. If you haven't done that, why not? We offer the invitation this evening. If we can help anyone, won't you come as we stand and sing?